fact, um, and including this one. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Brad Blicken uh, and, and uh, Jillian McKenna. Brad is the Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Coordinator at the park. Um, and he has been very privileged to do what I've made a, a, my life's work, which is hire people smarter than me. Not very hard in my case, harder in Brad's case. Um, but Jillian McKenna um, has, is just finishing up work um, with Brad this year as the GIS analyst on wilderness character mapping at the park. Um, and she has a fantastic presentation. And as always, we're going to spend a bunch of our time later in the program after her presentation uh, doing questions and answers. So, you know, Jillian, thank you very much for, uh, for spending your evening with us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Jillian, you, um, you um, were educated in Nova Scotia, as I understand, and you've been at, to Yosemite and, and Washington State. Tell us a little bit about what appears on its face to be a circuitous path to Glacier National Park and this work. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Newark, Delaware, uh, and I went to university at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, trying to get as far away from Delaware as possible and just explore the world. Um, I studied earth science, uh, where I took some intro GIS courses and kind of learned the basics. Um, and after I graduated, I went to hike the John Muir Trail and just fell in love with the park service and the mountains and wanted to figure out a way in. And actually on my drive back from California to Delaware, I got an interview uh, for a GIS internship at Yosemite that I was lucky enough to get into. And that's where I really got to build my GIS skills um, that I'm using for this project. And then, yep, I went to Washington State to Olympic National Park where I got my first real taste of wilderness in the park service from a management perspective. Uh, I was a wilderness ranger and kind of got my first wilderness trainings. Um, and then I was supposed to head to Rocky to work in the wilderness unit there, but with COVID, everything changed. Um, but because of that, I saw a job opportunity. Um, it actually said it was based out of Missoula with the parks to be determined, but it was to write um, the wilderness character monitoring plan for one of three parks. And I reached out to um, Roger, who is the, the chief of wilderness stewardship for the park service. and just so happened that one of those parks was Glacier, which has always been one of my dream parks to work at, if not the dream park. Um, so yeah, I ended up uh, out in, in West Glacier um, last October doing that project and then was introduced uh, to this mapping project by Brad kind of an off, off chance um, because I'd started to, to kind of let him know that I had these GIS skills and we're so thankful that you guys were willing to fund it so I could stay here and uh, really work on this project and learn more about it. Yeah, it was a, Brad gets a lot of credit for, for that because when we were talking about, so what, what might be possible, he said, boy, I have run into this person who's super smart. I could really use a little bit of help. And, and Lacey immediately saw the value of this. And I think within 48 hours had our board um, agree to, um, you know, put this project in place for this year, right? So it was an out of cycle request so that we could take advantage of uh, making sure you didn't leave, Jillian. That was our goal. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we, we asked you to take a chance with us and you've been through the summer. So talk to us a little bit about how this opportunity this summer has changed you. Yeah, it has been a huge change for me. Um, like I said, I studied earth science. So I originally came into the park service kind of trying to go the geology route. Um, and I can't tell you how many jobs I applied to even at an entry level where I wasn't even considered for an interview, even having experience. And I was kind of starting to get disheartened about it. Um, and then all of a sudden there was opportunity in wilderness, uh, something that I've learned this winter that I really love and I'm interested in working in. Um, and so this opportunity and having people kind of believe in what we want to do and willing to support it has really shown me that there's a lot that I can do out there that I want to do and there's the people who want to make it happen. Um, so yeah, it's really changed kind of my whole career path into something that looks a lot more exciting and like it can actually happen. So it's been, it's been a really awesome change. 
what a what a great phrase um, I just wrote down from you: opportunity in wilderness. Right? I think that's you know when you think about protecting the a park that is 99% plus um, you know managed as wilderness, um, that is really an opportunity to do something very special. And thank you again for um, for agreeing to sign up uh, for this year with us uh, with the park. And thank all of you because I know a lot of you made generous donations to the conservancy, part of which went to um, to this important work. So um, without further delay, Julian, I want to kind of turn it over to you to share your screen. Julian has put together a very robust um, presentation for us tonight that at the end of the evening, we're going to be able to make available the interactive link um, so that all of you can, uh, can work on this yourselves. Julian, off to you. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm going to just stop my video during this, um, just in case my internet starts to get a little bit slow. But can you guys all see the screen that I'm showing? See me scroll up and down? Cool. All right. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm going to try to keep this kind of as, as short as I can, but I get really excited talking about it. So there should still be plenty of time for questions at the end, but you're going to hear a lot from me. Um, so if you are new to wilderness character mapping and you haven't heard any of my presentations yet, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, if this isn't your first time you've heard me present, some of you have probably heard me three or four times now. Um, I have a surprise. As you can see, this is a different format from what I usually use. Um, I've been doing a PowerPoint. This is a story map, and it's going to allow me to show you um, the maps that I've made in an, a more interactive way. Um, I'm also not going to be going quite as in-depth on each measure, but as always, and for everybody, please feel free to ask more technical questions or whatever um, at the end of the presentation, or feel free to follow up with me after as well. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction to what wilderness character is before diving into the project. Um, so hopefully everybody is going to be able to feel, uh, get a bit of a feel of the basics before I get into the more technical stuff. Um, but like Doug said, we will be sharing the story map uh, with everyone at the end. So you'll see I've included some links and additional resources and videos that I won't be showing, um, but you can definitely check them out if this inspires you to do so. So on September 3rd, 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Wilderness Act, which is considered to be one of America's greatest conservation achievements by many people. A wilderness designation is the highest form of land preservation in the federal government. And so these lands, uh, designated lands, must be managed differently from other federal lands that don't have the protection. So the act states uh, the congressional policy. Um, it establishes the national wilderness preservation system. It prohibits certain uses and activities like motorized use. Um, it describes the key elements of a wilderness um, that have helped us to define wilderness character. And then it also created a process for adding new wilderness areas and required that within 10 years of the act, all roadless areas greater than 5,000 acres should be studied to determine suitability for wilderness. So section 4B of the act also states the six public purposes of wilderness, which guide how we manage the lands. And those are recreational, scenic, scientific, educational, conservation, and historical uses. So today there are 111 million acres of federal land designated as wilderness and many more that fall under a different category of wilderness, including glacier, which I'll talk about in a second. So this interactive map off to the right here, um, it's from a website called Wilderness Connect and it shows all of the designated wilderness areas in the National Park Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management and Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so definitely if you have some time later, I love scrolling through this map to see what wilderness areas are out there, especially if I'm going on a road trip, planning a trip, I can see what's out there. Um, and I'd also recommend checking out this video series that I posted here by the uh, National Park Service Wilderness Division, especially if you haven't had a chance to get out into wilderness in a while, it's a great reminder of how great it really is. So like I said, that map only shows designated wilderness in the US. Um, Glacier's wilderness is not included because it has not yet been designated. So in following the directive of the Wilderness Act, Glacier produced a wilderness study in 1973 on the park's roadless land and proposed that 927,550 acres of the park should be designated as wilderness. And that recommendation was sent to Congress by President Richard Nixon on June 13, 1974. 
And the bill was never actually enacted into law, but National Park Service policy still requires that the recommended wilderness be protected the same as if it were designated. So the green over here in the map uh, is our recommended wilderness boundary. The purple behind it is the entire park boundary. The orange and pink um, are recommended potential wilderness. The former acquired by the park since that 1974 recommendation. The latter, the pink, is still privately owned. So if you're interested to know, you know, if the area that you're going to is in recommended wilderness, this is a good place to look. You can see kind of the roads and trails underneath of it to see where you're going. So while the term wilderness uh, may refer more to the land itself, the term wilderness character describes it. So wilderness character is this holistic concept. It's based on the interaction of the biophysical environment that is based, or primarily free from modern human manipulation, the personal experiences one has when relatively free from those encumbrances of modern society, and then the symbolic meanings of humility, restraint, and interdependence um, that inspire human connection within nature. So wilderness character includes intangible qualities uh, like a sense of adventure or risk, but what we really focus on for our monitoring are the five tangible qualities of wilderness character. So the untrammeled quality surrounds the idea that wilderness is essentially unhindered and free from the intentional actions of modern human control or manipulation. And that's recognizing that people should practice humility and restraint when they take actions in wilderness. The natural quality is where ecological systems are substantially free from the effects of modern civilization. And that recognizes the importance of a healthy intact ecosystem. The undeveloped quality is where wilderness is essentially without permanent improvements or the sights and sounds of modern occupation. And that focuses on how wilderness can give us a chance to experience the natural world without the presence of modern development. The solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation quality is where wilderness provides opportunities for solitude or a primitive and unconfined type of recreation, recognizing that we as humans rely on wilderness to unplug from human life um, by doing recreational activities uh, compatible with wilderness. And finally, the other features of value quality, which does not necessarily apply to every wilderness area, um, is where wilderness uh, may also contain site-specific, ecological, geological, or other features of scientific, educational, scenic, or historical value. This quality recognizes the cultural traditions of indigenous peoples and other residents to lands that are now managed as wilderness. So land management agencies are not only uh, mandated to protect the wilderness land, but also to preserve wilderness character. So this is stated in the Wilderness Act, as well as in additional policies from the National Park Service. So you can see highlighted in yellow, the preservation of their wilderness character, preserving wilderness character. And we have words like must ensure, should, should, will conduct. And these are what dictate that we really need to be taking care and monitoring our wilderness character. So in order to do that, the National Park Service uses a system of building blocks for wilderness stewardship. Um, and this idea came about in 2014 when a team of scientists published a report called Keeping It Wild in the National Park Service, a user guide to integrating wilderness character into park planning, management, and monitoring. And this is kind of a more park service uh, specific of the interagency document that I'll mention in a bit. And it separates wilderness stewardship into three building blocks that are the foundation for effectively integrating wilderness character into park management in a way that complies with law and policy. So the first block is the wilderness basics, um, and that's gathering your background information, developing a wilderness character na uh, narrative, and identifying issues for future planning. And we completed this block this past winter as part of our wilderness character monitoring plan. The second, uh, the second block is the wilderness character assessment, and you select your measures for monitoring, collect your baseline data, and then conduct the ongoing monitoring. This winter, we chose our measures and started putting together a baseline assessment, which will be complete at the end of this year, 2021. And the next round of monitoring should occur in 2026 on that five-year interval. The third building block is integrating wilderness character into management and operations. And with this, we should be using minimum requirements analysis and considering wilderness character in day-to-day -day and large-scale operations. And tools like this mapping project are gonna help Glacier with this integration. So like I said, we created our wilderness character monitoring plan for Glacier this past winter um, as part of that second building block. That was my internship here this past winter. The framework for this monitoring uh, is from that interagency report called Keeping It Wild 2, 
um, and it allows for consistency across the national wilderness preservation system when it comes to wilderness character monitoring. So with this framework, wilderness character is broken down into the five tangible qualities and then asks um, at least one monitoring question under each with indicators under each of those. And up to here, these are all consistent at the national interagency level. And then the indicators are broken down into measures, which are locally relevant and park specific. Although there were many that were strongly suggested to us by the uh, Wilderness Stewardship Division of the Park Service. So the first step is to select your measures, make sure they're useful, simple, and practical. And trying to use current data protocols, not creating much new work or data. The park then conducts a baseline assessment, enters the data into the interagency database, conducts ongoing monitoring at a five-year minimum interval, and then assesses the trends in wilderness character over time. So we worked really closely with the team at the Wilderness Stewardship Division to build our plan, and we talked through our measures and protocols at length to make sure that we have a good plan that's easy to implement as the years go on. So they had a technical guide for wilderness character monitoring in the National Park Service. Um, we used that as well as prior other parks uh, assessments and a previous attempts at Glacier to pick uh, that to do this monitoring plan um, to help us pick our measures. And I will talk about those measures um, as I talk about the mapping project because it uses the same framework and they go hand in hand. So the mapping project, um, it's a project to map threats to wilderness character and it was developed by a group of scientists at the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute in Missoula and the Wilderness Research Institute in Leeds. And it's a GIS based approach to identify the state of wilderness character in the US. So the first park case study was Death Valley, which you can see on the right side here. Um, that's their final map. And this team also developed a set of technical guidelines for how to create the maps and develop the measures and analyze the data. And that's what we've been following for this project. So if you aren't familiar, GIS uh, stands for Geographic Information System. It's a spatial system that creates, manages, analyzes, and maps uh, all types of data. And the project uh, creates a visual way to see the cumulative impacts of threats to wilderness character. And this tool can be used in a variety of ways, setting and comparing to a baseline, finding data gaps, and it can even be used as a predictive tool to see how different management actions could impact wilderness character. So, so far, Death Valley, Olympic, Saguaro, uh, Sequoia and Kings Canyon, Black, Can Black Canyon of the Gunnison, Gates of the Arctic, Denali, and Boundary Waters have all completed this project, but they've all had the direct help of the Aldo Leopold Institute. And the people who worked on the project uh, have since left the Institute. And so now we believe that we are the first part to be trying this project uh, independently on our own. So like I said, the mapping project uses that same framework for wilderness character monitoring um, as the monitoring plan. And because we had just gone through that rigorous process of putting together a monitoring plan um, over the winter, we decided to use the same or variations of the same measures for the mapping project. So each measure has one or more data sources, either something that already exists or something that we would create. The data sets are processed to create what's called a raster data set. Basically, imagine having the entirety of Glacier's wilderness broken down into 30 by 30 meter square pixels. Each of those pixels will have um, a value, higher meaning a higher threat to wilderness character. And the color palette we chose is meant to be more colorblind friendly than a lot of the standard green to brown ones uh, that other parks have used. Um, so a dark green is the most optimal wilderness character leading up to a deep purple as the most degraded wilderness character. So I included a little example here um, of what a raster data set looks like. This is our trails data. And if I zoom in, you can see that purple degraded and you can see how it's not that smooth line of a trail. You can see the kind of pixel pixeliness of it. The data sets are then also normalized um, so that way we can add them all together. So the steps for, for doing this project, uh, you start by adding together all the data sets under a measure to get the measure maps, and then you add the measures to get the indicator maps, the indicators to get monitoring question maps, the monitoring questions to get the quality maps, and then in the end, you add together all the quality maps to get the total wilderness character map, which you can then analyze to get a quantitative state of your wilderness. So when you add each map, the individual pixels at each location add on to each other. For example, if there's a pixel, let's say in front of the Belly River Ranger Station, if you're familiar uh, with the park, where there's a lot of invasive 
plants, um, a lot of chainsaw use, a lot of weed spraying. Um, there's the building, the flagpole, maybe some scientific instruments. It's pretty quick to get to on the trail. The view shed is diminished because there's all of the, the human developments. All of those threats are gonna add together to create a darker purple square than say a pixel that's deep off in the forest in the Nyack where it's hard to get to, trees are blocking the view of any human developments. There's no installations and there's no weeds. So that pixel should be a dark green or more optimal wilderness character. And so I'm not quite done with this yet. Um, as Doug said, I'm kind of wrapping it up. So you are gonna see a few places where I've noted um, where things will continue to be updated, but I have gone ahead, gone ahead and added together what I have so far. Um, so everything that I just explained should start making more sense. Um, if you are a bit confused, don't worry. It's a very technical project. Um, this is, that was as technical as I'm really gonna get. Um, but hopefully once you see the measures, see some of these maps, um, it's gonna, gonna help explain that. So again, happy to go more in depth with uh, about the technical aspects later though, if anybody's interested. So instead of showing the measure map for every single one, like I have in previous presentations, we're just looking at the overall quality maps. And that's because as individual measures, some of that data can be considered a little bit more sensitive. So we kept it more broad um, just to share with the general public. So starting with the untrammeled quality, the monitoring question asks, what are the trends and actions that intentionally control or manipulate the earth and its community of life inside wilderness? The first indicator and its measure look at the number of authorized actions and persistent structures that are designed to manipulate plants, animals, pathogens, soil, water, or fire. So these include things like suppressing fire, spraying an area of weeds, stocking native fish, um, and we're looking at trampling actions at the project scale, so not just hand pulling a single weed. Um, and this is one of the few measures where we did have to create a data collecting protocol, um, but it is very simple and it's an easy addition to that end of your workflow. And then the other indicator and measure looks at the number of unauthorized trampling actions. Um, and these are again, large scale things, introducing a species or attempting to remove a species from wilderness, removing the boundary fence on the east side of the park um, or arson. So I'm still compiling our trampling actions and persistent structures. Um, we don't have any unauthorized ones yet so far in 2021, but we do have um, a few uh, authorized ones. So I'm just gonna zoom in down to uh, the area around Walton just so I can show you what that looks like. So up right here, you can see this is um, Scalpock Fire Lookout. I click here, you can see it has a little label of what it is to help you orient yourself if you wanna look yourself. So there was a small fire there that started uh, in that area this summer. Crews went up there to cut line to suppress it, which is a trampling action. And then down along the south boundary is where the railroad company um, had dropped bombs to, from a helicopter to help with avalanche mitigation. So that's another trampling action in our project. With the natural quality, we ask one question, and that is what are the trends in the natural environment from human caused change? So our indicators are plants, animals, air and water, and ecological processes. So for plants, we're looking at an index of invasive plant species and wilderness. And that index weighs each species based on its impact, trend, and presence in wilderness. So for the mapping project, we took the points from the park's integrated pest management team for weeds locations. But in the future, we actually would like to collect polygon data, um, get more off-trail monitoring as well to really see the impact of invasive plants that isn't quite shown here how we'd like. For animals, we have similar indexes, one for non-native terrestrial animal species and the other for non-native aquatic animal species in wilderness. And they look at the impact, the general distribution and whether the species impacts a federally listed species. So for mapping, um, we only have range data for cattle and white pine blister rust for terrestrial animals. So that's another area that we would like to improve on in the future. Um, however, our data for the non-native non aquatic species is pretty good. That's from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Under air and water, we then have four air quality measures that were developed by the Air Resources Division, um, and that's using data we collect already in the park, and then the division does all of the modeling for us. Um, and those are haze on most impaired days, ozone exposure to vegetation, nitrogen deposition, and sulfur deposition. Um, we also look at the number of Clean Water Act water quality impairments using the hydrographic and impairment statistics database. And then for ecological processes, we look at percent natural land cover using the National Landscape Dynamics Natural Converted Land Cover data. So if I just zoom in a bit, you can kind of see a bit more up close. You can see 
higher impacts at lakes that have a lot of non-native species like a Harrison Lake. Um, there's those big chunks on the side where there's cattle, cattle trespass. We have um, our one divide creek is our only clean water act water quality impairment. And you can kind of see how they all add together to form the natural quality map. For the undeveloped quality, um, monitoring is separated into two monitoring questions. What are the trends in non-recreational physical development and what are the trends in mechanization? With physical development, the first indicator is the presence of non-recreational structures, installations, and developments. And the measure we're using is an index of these administrative structures, installations, and developments. So these are things like buildings, dams, roads, scientific instruments, uh, even temporary ones, communications infrastructure, um, gates on mines, grazing infrastructure, and any other sort of administrative feature. So the index weighs the installations based on their impact to wilderness character. And I've been working on putting together this data set, data set actually since I started last fall. Um, we have a lot currently at 1,078 installations, but definitely still counting. Um, it kind of seems like we learn about more every day. And while some of those are sensitive data because uh, they have to do with scientific research. Um, so I couldn't show exactly where everything is, but I included this kernel density map here. And basically what this does is it gives um, a snapshot of where these installations are concentrated around the park. So this dark purple area up at the top is right around the Belly River Ranger Station. There's a lot of buildings and other installations there as well as around that kind of front country area of uh, many glacier, um, but also spread out throughout the park. Um, the second indicator under physical development is the presence of inholdings. Our measure is acres of inholdings, and that's an area of privately owned land that is completely within recommended or potential wilderness. So those sites around Lake McDonald are not actually included here. Um, under the second monitoring question, what are the trends in mechanization? Our indicator is use of motor vehicles, motorized equipment, or mechanical transport. And the measure is an index of these motorized and mechanical uses. And it counts days of use and then weighs it um, by the equipment's impact to wilderness character. So common types of motorized use at Glacier are chainsaws, power tools, aircrafts, uh, wheelbarrows, motorboats, bicycles, and a lot more. Um, so this is the other big measure that we created data for, but it was much needed. Um, it's easily actually fitting into that kind of end of season workflow. I've been collecting the data from uh, and compiling from all the different work groups um, these past few weeks. Um, and it's only going to decrease, this workload is only going to decrease if we can really minimize our use of these prohibited uses that are prohibited in the Wilderness Act. So, like I said, I've started compiling this. Um, there's still a lot to come in because it takes a while to compile, but I've started mostly with the trails data. You can see how it kind of is uh, pretty impacted along different trail corridors and we've done it. So things that have a larger impact have that kind of wider impact like a chainsaw versus a brusher. Um, I also wanted to just zoom in on the Kishining Ranger Station or Kishining Cabin. Um, where they were doing work at the fire cache this year. So you can see the impacts, the circular impacts of the motorized use, but then all those other pixels are the cumulative impacts from the installations that are there too. So there's a cabin, a fire cache, a woodshed, an administrative toilet, and an administrative hitch rail. Um, and so all of those you can see kind of add together to create those different levels of impact and threats to wilderness character. For solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation, um, we're again asking two questions. What are the trends and outstanding opportunities for solitude? And then what are those trends for primitive and unconfined recreation? So the first indicator um, looks at remoteness from sights and sounds of human activity inside of wilderness. First looking at um, the number of camper nights, although we would like to have a better measure in the future that um, better captures day use as well. The next measure looks at the acres of wilderness away from access and travel routes and developments inside wilderness. So buildings, uh, campgrounds, trails, and that's anything within one half of a mile of those developments is gonna be considered degraded here. So that's why you see kind of that big buffer along trails there. Um, we're also using a measure that wasn't in our monitoring plan here. That's a travel time model. Um, this model uses a tool in GIS to calculate the time it takes to get to each pixel in wilderness. It takes into account trail versus off-trail travel, 
the slope angle, the vegetation, um, and water crossings as well. So you really have to think of it in a literal sense. Um, a place that is quicker to get to is more degraded from a solitude perspective. Um, so even though likely nobody is going to some of these places along uh, the edges here, um, they are theoretically quick to get to um, and so present less opportunities for solitude. And you can see um, in the cumulative map where the edges are more uh, impacted than the center of the wilderness. The center is that darker green. The second indicator um, under that uh, monitoring question is remoteness from sights and sounds of human activity outside wilderness. And it uses a very similar measure as with inside, looking at the acres away from routes and developments outside wilderness. Um, and that's buildings, front country campgrounds, the international boundary, the chalets, um, all that. Again, half a mile uh, from those developments. And that is why also a lot of these edges are really degraded is from that. Um, what are the trends in the outstanding opportunities for primitive and unconfined recreation is that second monitoring question. The first indicator is facilities that decrease self-reliant recreation. So um, I showed you the miles of trail earlier, um, and you can see actually if you zoom in on the trails, you saw the trail buffer, but then when you look at the trails, there's the cumulative impact of the trail itself on top of that remoteness measure as well. Um, the second measure under the indicator is the number of authorized constructed recreation features. So things like campsites, food prep areas, benches, toilets, all the stuff that you see at a campground. Um, we have about 900 features, but those are very localized impacts. So it is hard to see them um, unless you really zoom in. So I can kind of show you at the, the Sperry campground, you can see how it really gets to be that darker purple color where those campsites and food prep areas and benches are really concentrated. Um, the other indicator under uh, primitive and unconfined recreation is management restrictions on visitor behavior. And the measure is an index of visitor management restrictions. It looks at restrictions on visitors from the superintendent's compendium and weighs the restrictions based on their spatial and temporal extents. And so that's added into this map as well. Um, so there is a kind of better or at least different way to show the impacts to solitude that we're currently working on as well. And that's a view shed model. It takes into account the slope, the vegetation height, the feature height, and the distance to see um, the impact of the view shed in each pixel by human development. And so if you think it sounds complicated, um, it most definitely is. So we cannot do this currently in-house. There's a model we're supposed to be used um, that was created uh, by a team at the Leeds Wilderness Research Institute. So I am currently still in the process of putting together all of that data to send them to run the model. Um, it's a really big process that takes a lot of computing power that I just don't have. Um, but other parks, um, every other park pretty much has used it and it seems like it's a really good addition to the map. Um, so this will be updated uh, when we get that data back. Unfortunately, we're not able to include the other features of value quality in our maps at this time. Um, most, if not all of the parks have unfortunately also had to do this. The issue is that um, cultural resource data is extremely sensitive and can't even be shared easily within the park. So even myself, I'm not able to see any of the spatial data that I would need to create the maps. Um, and because it's an inherently spatial project and the locations of the archeological sites and other cultural resources can't be shared, um, it just won't work for now, but it would be really great to figure out a way to, to include this somehow in the future, even if it's just for the internal use for the park to use. Um, for the monitoring plan, the measures that we did use are an index of conditional status of classified structures and an index of re uh, representative registered archaeological sites, and they both use the, the cultural resource condition assessments from the park. Um, and that's for the deterioration or loss of integral cultural resources or integral cultural features indicator. Um, we also were not able to include our other measure and that's an index of presence of iconic natural resources under the deterioration or loss of other integral site specific features of value indicator because that is a positive measure um, and we have created negative maps focusing on the threat. So while it is possible to also create a positives map, um, that's kind of the only measure that we have with data that would uh, go along with it. So if in the future this turns into a negative thing, um, if hopefully it doesn't, but if white, bine, white bark pine goes extinct, 
theoretically, we could make this into a negative where it's the lack of the range. Um, but currently, which is lucky, we do have all of the iconic natural resources that we've set out. So this is our wilderness character map all together so far. Again, this is going to change as I finish up the maps, um, but I think it's really still cool to see it at this stage. You can see how all the different threats um, have added together and created uh, cumulative impacts of very spatially over the entire wilderness. So if you guys have the interest, definitely zoom in, pan around it yourself again. Once you zoom into this level, you'll be able to click on um, their points of interest and place names. So you can kind of orient yourself a bit to see um, where things are going. So I'll zoom in on the Belly River Ranger Station area because that is probably one of, if not my favorite places in Glacier's Wilderness. Um, and just to kind of show you, um, there are a lot of localized high impacts that that pink is kind of in the middle, leaning towards that degraded area. And that's because, you know, there's a lot going on there mostly in, in the development sense. Um, but if you look around it, you can see how much green intact wilderness character there is still around it, which you definitely, I think, feel when you're there. So um, with this, the kind of analytics we can look at, um, we currently have about 61% of our wilderness pixels are in the top 10% most optimal wilderness character category. And it's kind of a weird way to think about it, but basically a lot of our wilderness is incredibly optimal. You can see on this graph here how much it leans towards the most optimal side to the left. Um, we only have right now eight pixels in that least optimal category. So that's really, really awesome. So to kind of switch gears and, and bring this uh, towards the end, um, I wanna talk about the most important thing and that's uh, how the, this mapping project is going to help and why did we do it? Um, so first of all, monitoring and mapping wilderness character helps managers um, comply with the law and NPS policy that I mentioned before. It provides the concrete information that managers need to preserve wilderness character um, and to determine if wilderness stewardship is improving or degrading over time. And if it's degrading, managers really need to make changes to protect the land as it's supposed to be protected. Um, this project also helps to improve wilderness stewardship and communication. So tracking changes in wilderness character helps to assess uh, the wilderness conditions. It can allow us to prioritize actions, inform planning, communicate needs, improve accountability for managers. And of course it establishes that baseline and legacy information to use in the future. The monitoring creates a connection between the on the ground wilderness condi conditions and then management actions. And it helps identify the specific and cumulative impacts to wilderness character. So this gives managers the data that they actually need to create solutions and restore any impacted areas. And it also helps to remind managers that they need to treat wilderness as the resource that it is and approach the management of it with humility, respect, and restraint, not just choosing the easy way out for a project. Um, this project and the monitoring plan also help us to understand the trade-offs to wilderness character. So often management decisions can improve one quality while degrading another, even if that action is deemed the minimum necessary. Um, so example of that is if we're using chainsaws to clear a trail from a major blowdown, um, the natural quality is preserved or improved by preventing research resource damage from hikers trampling vegetation to avoid those trees. And it's also actually helping to support um, that public purpose of wilderness recreation. Um, however, using chainsaws does degrade the undeveloped quality, even if a minimum requirements analysis has been done to determine that they are the minimum tool necessary to complete the job. And so over time, even small actions can add up to cause significant degradation to wilderness character. And the mapping project really helps us see those cumulative impacts giving managers um, a tool to make decisions and take actions that have the preservation of wilderness character always in mind. And finally, um, the monitoring plan and mapping project are helping the park prepare for the next step, um, which is a wilderness stewardship plan. And that would lay out the specifics of managing Glacier's wilderness, which would ensure for better preservation and restoration in the long run. So um, finally, just a quick future um, ideas and improvements. We'd really, like I said, like to get better non-native plant and animal data for the mapping project. We'd like to collect, collect day use visitation data, figure out a way to integrate that cultural resources data into the mapping. Um, we'd like to create our own in-house view shed modeling so that we can use it more easily as a predictive tool. 
We want to figure out how to monitor and map the intangible qualities of wilderness character, create a positives map, like I mentioned. And then, of course, um, we always want to keep trying for wilderness designation. Um, like I said, designation is the highest form of land protection. And without it, we are always running the risk of our wilderness degrading if leadership goals and focuses change. So if you check this out yourself, I have included um, kind of these resources here. Um, it give, can tell you more about wilderness in the Park Service at Glacier, um, and then also federal agency wide, as well as those the videos, which um, kind of, we don't have one for Glacier yet, hopefully one soon, but you can kind of look at some other parks. Um, and finally, finally, I just wanna say a quick thank you to um, all of you guys at the Conservancy for supporting our idea and making this project happen. Um, any of you who have donated, thank you so much um, for helping fund our dream. I know this is definitely, definitely my dream. Um, and also thank all of you uh, who are here tonight for listening. I'm excited to hear if you guys have any questions or comments. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Doug. Wow, um, Jillian, thanks so much. What an incredible body of work that you have uh, accomplished. It's really inspiring to um, hear from you and to learn um, at your knee, if you will, about something so critically important. I was just kind of, I, I kind of have to put this in different frameworks. So as I understand it, 30 meters by 30 meters is a pickle, pixel. Mm -hmm. So if I think about that as a soccer pitch, um, soccer pitches are generally 60 meters wide and 100 meters long. So six pixels in a soccer pitch, right? Two wide, three long. Yeah, that math so sounds right. I'm not I got that familiar said. with soccer, but the math sounds right. Okay, all right, well, so we'll go for, we can go football and then you can go Ted Lasso or um, <laughs> Tom Brady, either way. Um, but I think if I had you write that there were only eight pixels in the million acres of Glacier National Park that are in that lowest category. So I think about that in my head, a million acres, a little bit more than a football field is in that highest degraded. That tells me that we're doing something right, okay? And that we have a lot at risk in making sure we continue to do this right for future generations. So thank you for leading the way um, and, uh, and being with us tonight. I, Amy, I know we've got some, some questions in the chat. We also have some giveaways to do. We've got a code epoxy backpack. I think, Grace, you've got that handy somewhere. If you've not seen these uh, specially branded GNPC code epoxy partnership packs, um, that we're gonna be giving one of those away um, to celebrate uh, Grace's accomplishment. And also, uh, Amy, I think you have to show a, a buff um, this is a, a goat buff, and I am our next, uh, in fact, our next Glacier conversation uh, is going to be with the old goat and the young goat who are next to me here in my background now, uh, an 11-year-old and 81-year-old granddaughter and grandmother who decided to spend part of their summer raising money in a climate hike in Glacier um, and did 50 miles together. Um, and raised $8,000 for um, the work we're doing here at the Glacier Conservancy. And they're gonna be with us to uh, tell their story in early December, so come on back. Um, with that, Amy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I know uh, there's, a, there's some questions in the chat and we've still got about 15 minutes to get to those. Yeah, let's start with some questions and then we'll get back to our winners of the giveaways. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read down the chat um, Jillian. Uh, our first question was from our friend Carl, and he wants to know, are these maps um, being used for, or are they going to be used for fire management in any way? Actually, I have a much bigger uh, question about the GIS. Uh, it's kind of hard to type it up. Uh, Jillian, uh, I was involved with developing GIS uh, in the San Diego area, and once you had the system, it, the functionality grew dramatically. You know, if somebody wants this link to it, that link to it. Are there long-term plans to have these maps linked to like uh, satellite photos, webcams, uh, other types of reports, systems, and so forth? So in an ideal world, yes. And when I think of all of my future goals and hopes for where it can go, that is the direction I'd like. I think every single person who works or even comes to the park can find use out of um, these types of maps. Um, 
with the capacity we currently have and the fact that um, Glacier only has one GIS coordinator for the entire million acre park, um, it, it's not necessarily feasible, you know, within the next little bit of time, but I would say that is my overall goal for it. Um, I do talk with pretty much everybody I have a chance to. Um, I've been talking a lot with our integrated pest management team leader um, about how we can integrate this more into his work. Um, and I think that's, you know, what you got to start small and, and start mm -hmm. doing it one, one step at a time. But yes, my, my thought is that this really could be used for even more than we've thought that it can be used for. Yeah, you'll find that to be true. So put on your seatbelt. You're going for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for it. Yes. <laughs> Great question, Carl, and good point. Um, Sarah had a question. How do things like air tours and administrative flights affect primitive and remoteness characteristics? I think that's maybe not something that you didn't mention. Yeah, there. Um, it's kind of a, a huge impact. The reason it's not included is because um, we don't currently have a great way to monitor it. Um, the air tour management plan that's coming out or just came out or is in the process, um, we'll hopefully make that a little better, but we don't, we didn't have it set up for what we needed to do. Um, but that it plays into that remoteness from sights and sounds of human activity outside of wilderness. Um, if you consider the, the airspace, whether it be inside or outside would determine where it goes. Um, a big part of that impact is the soundscape, which is something we'd like to um, figure out how to do in the future. There has been a baseline monitoring for some aspect of soundscape at Glacier, but I've had a hard time kind of tracking it down and there hasn't been any repeated um, thing yet. So that's definitely um, on our list to do. And we do have kind of the air tour um, and administrative flights um, as a hopeful future measure in our monitoring plan that could then add into the mapping project if we get that good data. Um, but we just didn't have something that was good enough to use for it right now. And Barb is wanting to know, does heat mapping from other sources contribute data to our wilderness measurements? Um, we did not use any specifically, like anything that had already been heat mapped in, in a sense. Um, we took more data from, from the, the start um, and brought it through ourselves, um, mostly because didn't really see all that much out there. So if you've seen it, love it if you'd send it to us. Um, like I was kind of mentioning, we, we started this project from our monitoring plan and just kind of went through with it. So we didn't necessarily look into every single possible measure we could throw in it because we wanted it to sit more with the monitoring plan and be more of a visual way to show that. Um, a lot of parks included like cell coverage, which we did have originally, but it ended up being so, it's something that's so out of our control that while it is a threat, it doesn't maybe do us as much use from the management perspective. It looks, it doesn't look cool, but like it, it's a, it's an interesting thing to look at in the map. But when you're thinking of how we're going to use it as a tool for management, it's not necessarily that helpful. Um, and so if there are kind of those other heat maps out there that could be useful, it would be interesting to, to see if they would fit into any of our maps. Uh, David wanted to make sure that these links would be provided and I will uh, paste the link in here in just a minute. Um, and then uh, we should add it to when we post it online as well. So just so you know, you all can go back and, and look at Jillian's presentation. Uh, Daniel has a question that maybe a few of us are thinking. Um, what's what location within Glacier National Park is the most wild, Jillian? Yeah, so um, this is actually something that came up in the, the last presentation to the Conservancy Board. And the reason I didn't include it in this um, is that that's for you to find out. It's as soon as you advertise what's the most wild, it often quickly becomes the least. Um, I shared a story then I, when I was working at Olympic, there were so many tales of people playing music out loud on their phone as they're trying to find the square inch of silence um, and just never being able to get to it because if you're playing music, it, it's not gonna be silent. So, um, you know, in general, as you get farther in, there's gonna be more, um, more intact wilderness character just in, in how things work. Um, 
the longer it takes to get to, the more likely that other people haven't been there to bring in the weeds. You're not gonna see other people. Um, you might still find some scientific instruments, but maybe not, you know, a cabin. Um, so yeah, I would say that the areas of most wild are if you wanna explore, especially the off trail areas, but everywhere in our wilderness does have wilderness character. So anywhere that you wanna go, you should be able to feel that sense of wild. Great answer. Um, I'm gonna ask one more and then we'll get to our giveaway winters, uh, winners. Uh, Patricia is asking sort of a policy question, but is it correct that there was a recent decision to phase out air tours over Glacier? Anybody want to take that? That's a question for Brad if he's still on. Yeah, can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Can. Okay, I can answer that. We are still in the process of our air tour management plan with the FAA, but it dramatically reduces the amount of flights in a real nutshell. At the highest it's ever been, we had over 800 flights, I believe, plus or minus in a year over the park. We'll be down to about 143, and there's a phase out port, uh, a phase out um, part of the plan if the current operators sell their business. So that has been included, which was a big win for us was to have an endpoint. Um, hopefully, that makes sense. Is there any more questions about that? Nothing at the on the chat right now. If anybody wants to to unmute and speak up, feel free. Really appreciate having you here as well, Brad. Thank you for being here and for answering that for us. No, but um, I, let's give away, go ahead, sorry. No, the more I talk, the more I muck it up. Jillian does the best <laughs> part of talking, so, so thank you. Okay, so once again, it's a backpack. Grace, can you show our backpack? If you still have it there. There it is, Code Epoxy Pack. It's wonderful. Um, and our big winner tonight is Sarah Lundstrom. Sarah, thanks for being on, for asking a question, and we will reach out to you um, and get a good mailing address for you and get the backpack out to you. And then I have the buff, which keeps coming in and out. Um, super useful. Those of you who are not entered the buff world, they're awesome. You can wear them as a headband. You can just wear them as a hat or a little scarf thing. Um, and David Simmons is our big winner tonight. So David, will get in touch with you as well. Um, awesome. We have one more question in the chat at this point. Um, what are you going to be doing next, Jillian? Sort of what are your next steps? Well, that was my, that was my question too. What's next? Oh, <laughs> that's uh, always a, a great question. Um, right now, uh, I have recently, from being inspired of getting this opportunity. Um, I've recently signed up for uh, University of Montana's um, Wilderness Management Graduate Certificate Distance Education course, basically an online graduate certificate to learn um, wilderness management. Um, it should take about two years. And after that, hopefully I'll, I'll know a bit more from the management perspective to be able to pull that in. Um, but as far as work, um, you know, it's really, really encouraging um, to see how, how much it seems like the park and the conservancy and its owners uh, are committed to supporting wilderness. So I'm hopeful that, um, you know, more things will come. I'd love to, to stay at Glacier and be able to do some more work here um, and keep improving what we're doing and, and do some new things. Um, so yeah, I, as far as I know, I will be staying in wilderness, but we'll have to wait and see. Well, that's, uh, we, we would be very privileged to have you remain in our community. I love the circuitous route that got you here. And um, I think I'd speak for everyone who, who is with us tonight uh, to see this kind of energetic, smart talent come into our community and make a real difference. I mean, to think, just think about the value of what we have here, right? If, if wilderness designation is the end point, um, there are certain barriers to that. One of them is not having wilderness character mapping and, and that Jillian and Brad and, and all of you, each of you as, as contributors to the cause um, have helped us get over that barrier. Um, that's just a huge thing. So um, thank you for 
for all of that. Thank you for just a wonderful, another wonderful evening together in community um, with fellow people who love Glacier. Um, I get inspired every time I do this, um, and particularly inspired when it's somebody like uh, Jillian uh, leading the way. So um, thank you again, Jillian, for being with us. Um, we um, are all in on supporting additional wilderness projects, and I know that our donor community is also all in. And so let's just hope that this is uh, the first of many of these as we uh, work together to continue to protect um, this very special place. So um, with that, thank you everybody for your, your time again tonight. Um, thumbs up, claps, snaps for Jillian. Um, and we will look forward to gathering again at a Glacier Book Club near you uh, or a Glacier Conversations uh, in December. So thanks again, everybody, and good night. Thank you so much for having me and for listening, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good work.